So all right, yeah, that. yeah. Thank you, Elena and Miguel, um, for, for inviting me to to present my um, our paper here, and also for for putting together these um, very nice um, seminars. So this is going to be about uh, two papers. Um, one which came out a few weeks ago and another one which hopefully will come out in, in a few weeks, um, both together with Josef Bena, Johan Blaber, and Mariana Grania. So, and um, what I'm, I'm going to talk about is in, in general flux compactifications. Um, and as, as you're probably aware of, um, flux compactifications are kind of uh, one of the, the key concepts to understand the, the huge landscape of, of string theory vacua, um, which um, has been estimated um, by sophisticated statistical methods. And um, there are assumed to be 10 to the a very big number of, of different um, string uh, theory vacua um, or flux vacua. And uh, a way to see that there should be a lot of these vacua is that there's Calabi-Yau manifolds with a large number of Hodge numbers and therefore a large number of, of different cycles. Therefore, I have a, a huge number of putting, putting fluxes on these different uh, cycles. So there's just a huge combinatorical number to, to generate such vacuum. But um, one should keep in mind that um, these fluxes are not unconstrained. Um, they have to be integer quantized and they have to satisfy a so-called tadpole cancellation condition. And um, these two conditions are, are together are pretty strong and they actually only, only with these conditions, uh, this becomes a meaningful result because the fluxes were not constrained. I mean, I could have arbitrarily many um, um, of, of this vacuum. So um, when, when we talk about flux compactification, the goal or the difficulty is to obtain a consistent vacuum and to stabilize all moduli, to give masses to all moduli within these two constraints. And here I want to um, discuss a few ideas that there might be maybe issues if there's really a large number of these moduli to um, um, to satisfy all these constraints simultaneously. So um, this is what I'm, I'm planning to talk about. I, I want to start with a very short review of, of flux compactifications and tadpole cancellation in general, then present our conjectures, what we dubbed the tadpole conjectures. I will give a um, example, um, which should provide evidence for these conjectures, which is M theory or F theory on, on K3 times K3. And um, in the last few minutes, I hope to discuss some implications on, on digital vacua and uh, anti-brain uplifts. Uh, so let me start with uh, flux compactifications. So the setup, um, for example, is type 2B on a Calabi-Yau threefold. So I have a typically warped product of this form of some four-dimensional space time, for example, Minkowski 4 and the Calabi-Yau manifold or in general Calabi-Yau orientifold, and I will get a four dimensional n equals to two or in the orientifold case n equals to two uh, supergravity action. And um, the thing is that um, these Calabi-Yau manifolds have uh, many moduli, many um, deformation parameters. I end up with a lot of uh, massless scalar fields in, in the four dimensional theory, um, which typically are of two different kinds. They are the Kähler moduli, um, their number is given by the Hodge number H11, and they correspond, roughly speaking, to, to the volumes of the two or the fourth cycles of this manifold. And they're the so-called complex structure moduli. The number is given by H21, and they correspond to the volumes of the three cycles. And um, for many reasons, um, for example, phenomenological reasons, these uh, massless scalar fields are unwanted. We don't uh, see them in our world. So we somehow have to find a mechanism to, to generate uh, masses for them. And in, in type 2B, uh, string theory or supergravity, um, the nice situation is that I have three form fields so I can give a, a vacuum expectation value to these three form fields on these topological three cycles of the manifolds. This is what I usually call fluxes. And 
uh, activating these fluxes, giving some non-trivial wave to these fields, will fix the sizes of the three cycles and will therefore um, provide masses for the complex structure moduli. Um, so to be a bit more specific, so if I have um, some, some non-trivial F3 and H3, I can combine them in this G3. I have a kinetic term for um, this guy. And since the Hodge star depends on the Calabian metric, this will generate a potential for the moduli or um, even a bit more specific in, in terms of uh, n equals to one uh, four dimensional supergravity. I can write down a super potential of the following form, which is G3 um, wedge the holomorphic three form on that manifold. And then by taking the derivative with respect to the H21 complex structure moduli, I get F term equations of the following form. And if I count um, equations and moduli, I see that I actually have exactly the same number of equations and, um, and moduli. So generically, I assume that this is stabilizing all my moduli. Um, but of course, there's a technical difficulty here that this um, evaluating these F-term equations requires the knowledge of these uh, period integrals, which in, in general can be um, quite, quite difficult, actually. And as I said, um, fluxes are not constrained. There's a so-called Tatpo cancellation conditions. If I look at the Bianchi identity of the five-form field strength in, in type 2b, this is at the following form. So there can be sources for, for um, the five-form or the, the four-form uh, gauge field. And, but I can also have sources coming from F3 and H3. And if I integrate it, I get the integral of F3 um, which H3, and this has to sum up together with all localized sources um, to zero. What can be localized sources? Localized sources can be, for example, D3 brains, um, O3 planes, and also D7 brains, O7 planes, but also um, world volume fluxes on the D7 brains. And to get a, a fluxes which are generically positive, I therefore need a a negative contribution from these uh, localized sources. So I want to put, for example, a certain number of O3 planes or a certain number of D7s and O7s. Um, okay, I can, it's maybe even easier to, to look at the whole problem in the context of M-theory or F-theory. Um, so if I consider F theory or M theory on a Calabria of fourfold, the situation, I can, I can play a very similar game. I have H31 complex structure moduli, which correspond to the volumes of the four cycles and I can stabilize them by switching on uh, four form flux on these four cycles. Again, this can be um, phrased in terms of a super potential, which is again of a very similar form. And uh, these four form fluxes have to satisfy uh, um, a type of cancellation condition. Again, I have the integral of, of these fluxes G4, which G4 over the internal space. And the nice thing is that now the contribution of all these localized sources, these D7s, O7s, et cetera, in type 2B can be nicely encoded in terms of the Euler number of um, the Calabria fourfold. So uh, just in terms of a topological um, number which um, will simplify the whole story, hopefully. So um, let me now come to um, our tadpole um, conjectures. So um, let's talk a little bit more about tadpole cancellation F theory. As I said, um, the um, tadpole cancellation condition is of this form on the left hand side, I have the contribution of the fluxes. On the right hand side, I have the Euler number of the fourfold I compactify on. And since the Euler number is a, is a topological number, I can express it in terms of the other um, topological quantities. In this case, the Hodge numbers of the Calabria. And one can derive the following formula. So um, the, um, the Euler number is essentially given by, by some um, of, of these Hodge numbers times six. And there's also a constant piece. Um, so, and since we're talking here about um, the stabilization of complex structure moduli, um, and in particular the stabilization of a large number of complex structure moduli, I'm mostly interested how does this Euler number, how does the right hand side of this equation scale 
with the number of complex structure moduli. And if I take this and this together, one easily sees um, that this scales like a quarter of the number of complex structure moduli. Um, so if I have a manifold with a lot of complex structure moduli, um, and I want to stabilize all these complex structure moduli by fluxes, the amount of, of um, flux I can put is such that uh, the left-hand side here does not exceed uh, one quarter of the number of moduli from these considerations. Um, and naively one would say, this is no problem. I just uh, tune my fluxes to be as small as I want. But as I said in the beginning, uh, these fluxes have to be integer quantized. Actually, the, the actual condition is slightly more subtle than I presented it here. Uh, but I think for the sake of the argument, that's okay. Um, so, and since these fluxes are integer quantized, I can of course not tune them arbitrarily small. So the question we want to ask is how, um, so assuming I have fluxes which stabilize all moduli, how does this quantity scale as the number of H31, um, the number of moduli? So we know the scaling of the right-hand side. So it's, I think, a natural question to ask what is the scaling of the left-hand side? Um, you, mean, you mean H4, right? Of course. Um, I mean H31, actually, because H31 no, I mean, is... No, I mean your equation, G, it's a minor point. You have written H upper 2, you mean H upper 4. Oh, yeah, I, of course, yeah, sorry, yeah, I mean H4, yeah. That's actually because later on I will talk about K3 and then it will be H2. Uh, exactly, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, yeah. Um, clearly, that's H4. Um, okay, and so um, these considerations led us to um, formulate um, the following conjecture, um, which we call the Tadpole conjecture. So assuming we have F theory on a Calabria fourfold or, or M theory um, on a Calabria fourfold, and later on at some point we might want to, to go to the F theory limit. And um, we are in a regime where we have a large number of complex structure moduli, so where H31 is a large number. And we assume we, we find a flux um, which stabilizes, uh, integer flux which stabilizes all these moduli. And um, for the time being, we also want to assume that we are at a generic point of moduli space. So we have a smooth Calabria fourfold. And then we conjecture that the D3 charge, or in the case of M theory, the better to call it the M2 charge of these fluxes satisfies um, a linear relation. So we assume that it scales um, linearly um, with the number of, um, of moduli. So this charge is uh, always larger than, than alpha times the number of moduli where alpha supposedly is a, is a order one constant. Um, and we also, when, when looking at examples, we found that for all examples, this constant seems to be larger than, than one over three. Um, so we also um, formulated a refined version where we conjecture that this alpha is always larger than one over three. And if I just um, for a second go back to the previous um, slide, I mean, the right hand side, so the right hand side, this equation scales like one over four times the number of moduli. Um, so clearly there's some critical behavior. Um, at, at alpha equals to one over four. So if alpha is larger than one over four, I probably would not expect uh, uh, compactification satisfying this criteria at a large number of complex structure moduli. So, uh, um, so okay. um, so you assume here that H11 is not also large, right? In that case, I could probably have a large enough tadpole if this conjecture is satisfied. Um, so I think to, to formulate this conjecture as that, I, I don't really um, need to assume anything about H11. But of course, if I um, want to make the argument that um, the left-hand side is, uh, is growing larger than the right-hand side with the number of moduli, for example, this alpha being larger than 1 over 3, and here I'm having a 1 over 4, then of course um, I only create tension if H11 is small. Um, of course, then uh, eventually I will also need to stabilize these H11 moduli by, for example, non-perturbative effects, etc. 
but um, that's something I, I do not want to talk about here, actually. I mean, I, I only want to touch complex structure moduli stabilization. So for the time being, yeah, I, I should assume that H11 is small and that the, I only generate a, a large uh, Euler number by, by a large number of complex structure moduli, yeah. Okay, thanks. But I think I can formulate this conjecture without uh, referring to, to H11 at all, actually. So, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, just to be clear, uh, the conjecture you're making is about what is the minimal value that the integral of G4, which G4 can have in, in the fourfold, right? You're saying that the minimal value can get is something bigger than this. Um, I'm saying that this is the, the minimal value, yeah. You're I right. mean, you're I, right. I can of course, always make this larger um, by, um, by, for example, scaling scaling my fluxes, etc. Um, of course, eventually I, I want to exactly satisfy this type of constellation conditions, um, but I could, for example, assume that I have a, a certain number of M2 brains here or, or D3 brains in the FD. Sure, sure. sure. Such, yeah. I just want to um, understand, but, this is really a geometric statement about the pairing in H4 in the Calabria. Exactly, yeah. This, this is a statement about the pairing Thank in H4, yes. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Indeed, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And, um, yeah, this is the minimal value. Severin, how important is smoothness going to be? It's a very bad assumption in general. Sorry, I did not understand that. Can you go back to the last slide? So, so, so certainly there are Calabiaos that are uh, smooth, the generic complex structure, but the vast majority of known Calabiaos don't have that property. I'm curious how important that is for your conjecture. Um, so, the the short answer is I, I don't really know um, how how important that is. Um, however, um, I mean it would be would be interesting to like study study more examples where um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it, it's not critical. Yeah. But um, so the reason why I phrase it because later on I, I want to to talk about this example of K three times K three, sure. and uh, there we specifically see that we we can lower this this charge of the flux is a, a lot if we if we allow the the manifolds to become singular, but if we demand them to to remain smooth, we we really see that we have a um, a, a relation like this. So in in this example, which we which we studied in detail, the smoothness um, actually um, was was a critical critical component of these conject, uh, conditions. Yeah. Um, but of course, I mean, it, it would be interesting to see. I mean, yeah, of course, in realistic um, examples and for realistic um, generic Calabria fourfolds, I mean, I expect some some singularities, and um, would be interesting to see I mean, if if one can still formulate a, a similar statement or just a slightly milder milder form of the statement. I mean, it could be that there's a pretty natural map from the way that you use the smoothness in this case to something more general in the singular case, but. Um... I guess I'll have to see where exactly it enters. So, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah. Let's um, shortly let's shortly compare this with uh, the type two B picture. So, um, my my H three one four four moduli um, in F theory they become the H two one complex structure moduli of the three four the the type two B axodilatin and also certain number which we call N seven of the seven brain moduli. And the, the charge carried by the fluxes becomes um, the charge carried um, by um, the three form fluxes um, in, in type 2b, and also um, a contribution carried by um, the, the world volume fluxes on the D7 world volumes. And um, the, the, um, the Euler number of the color VR becomes um, the um, localized D3 charge of the D7 brains and O7 planes, which can be expressed in terms of uh, their, um, their Euler numbers. Um, so, and, and these considerations allow us to translate these conjectures um, in terms of um, in terms of type 2b quantities. So we can we can formulate a type 2b conjecture A. So assuming I have a type 2b on a Calabria threefold and I have a large number of H21 complex structure moduli, and I stabilize all of them by fluxes G3, um, we again conjecture that the, the, the charge carried by these fluxes scales linearly with uh, the number of moduli. 
and we can make a similar statement or maybe try to make a similar statement about um, D7 brain moduli. So if we have D7 brains wrapping a certain four cycle um, of, of, uh, the three, uh, of the threefold, and we assume that uh, all of um, the D7 brain moduli are stabilized by, by world volume fluxes, we again conjecture that uh, the charge carried by these fluxes scales linearly with the number of moduli. So um, in, in general, um, we, we conjecture that um, if I stabilize fluxes, uh, if I stabilize moduli with fluxes, um, the charge carried by these fluxes scales linear with the number of moduli which, I, which is stabilized. Um, okay, let's, um, let me just present a very few um, supporting um, examples from the literature. This is uh, by no means a complete list. I mean, these are just few um, examples which uh, seem to be compatible with uh, our um, uh, conjecture. So there's, for example, this paper by Colinocci, Denev, and Esola. Um, where they consider F theory on a certain fourfold, which uh, has the CP3 as a base manifold. And this fourfold has a large number, namely the 3,878 of, of complex structure moduli, which um, corresponds to pretty large chi over 24. And one sees that in the type 2B limit, almost all of these moduli actually correspond to um, seven brain moduli. And they, um, explicitly try to stabilize all these moduli by fluxes. And they found that if they want to have world volume fluxes which stabilize all these moduli, that the, the charge carried by these fluxes is um, roughly a 3,200 and, and something. So it's actually almost as large as the number of moduli. And in particular, it exceeds, uh, it, it exceeds um, the, the localized charges which I have to which I have available. So I, I'm actually not, one is actually not able to um, stabilize all of these uh, moduli in the tadpole bound. Um, a different um, paper I'd like to mention um, where here it is about um, the complex structure moduli of a threefold. Um, this very nice paper is actually, um, has, a, has a slightly different goal. It's um, about uh, showing a very nice mechanism to, um, to generate a, a small W naught. But um, they, they again provide an explicit example of a threefold which H to one being um, almost 300. And um, they give a specific choice of fluxes which stabilizes all these moduli. And this has um, Q flux of uh, 124. So again, this is um, slightly less than half the number of complex structure moduli. Um, but here, actually, they, they find a flux which is compatible with tadpole um, cancellation because here one, one can have a lot of D7s and O7, which, which give a large negative contribution. And also, I think it was not their goal to really found a, a minimal Q flux. Um, but again, I think this fits nicely um, with our conjecture. And then there was a very recent paper by Fong and Valando where they studied um, modular stabilization on the sextic, for example. This is um, 426. Um, complex structure moduli, and they explicitly look for, for fluxes which stabilize all moduli. And here they found something um, of this size. So this um, found fluxes of this size, which A is actually not com compatible with tadpole cancellation. And again, is roughly um, one half of, of the number of moduli. And um, I would now like um, to discuss another example, namely M theory on K3 times K3, where we can uh, very explicitly um, search for really the, the minimal, um, for fluxes with a minimal charge. Okay. Can I have a um, question? So I think we're quick. Oh, yeah, sorry. Maybe, do you want to go first, Aaron? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll ask. I mean, uh, so, uh, so D7 moduli, like open spring moduli, um, they have a, a, they should have a compact moduli space, no? Um, because you cannot, you cannot move a brain, you know, like the, the moduli space of D3 brains is just a calabial. So that's actually compact. Uh, so I, I would have expected that one should differentiate between non-compact moduli spaces that have runaway directions and open string moduli spaces that are compact. Um, and then, 
one would have expected that, I mean, the usual argument of why people don't worry about open string moduli is that they have a compact moduli space. So um, there's no runaway problem with them. So whatever, any effect um, whatsoever will always stabilize all those moduli. Um, and then one has to worry about the non-compact non moduli spaces. And presumably one can look at like, you know, the mirror of the quintic just has one such complex structure modulus. Does this analysis differentiate between compact and non-compact um, sectors in the moduli space? Or am I wrong in saying um, the moduli space is compact for open string fields? Is that correct or not? I don't know, I'm not sure. I, don't know. Um, I mean, a, I mean, we, we did not really explicitly differentiate between between compact and non-compact moduli, uh, even though I, I definitely agree. I mean, if I if I have a, a non-compact moduli space, I mean, I, I would never expect, for example, after a digital uplift to run away on, on that compact moduli space. So either it stays completely flat or, flat or it, uh, it has a minimum somewhere, right? Um, so the, the uh, seven moduli is not compact. What do you mean, Iran? I mean, isn't that the complex in the F theory, for example, the moduli space of the elliptic degeneration is at the seven brain positions. So that's, that's a complex, complex, from the F yeah, theory right. perspective, it's complex moduli, it's not compact. That's what I'm saying, that, that if, I'm, if you look at the 2B perspective, the, 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 there are two kinds of moduli spaces. No, no, I thought you said the seven brain is compact. It's not compact. The seven brain? The seven brain moduli is not compact. Yeah, this is what I was asking. I don't know. It's not, I mean, it's not because I mean the elliptic moduli, the moduli space of the seven brain position is the moduli of moduli of complex structure, part of the moduli of the complex structure in F the elliptic vibration. So therefore that's not compact. So that's what I wanted to know. I wasn't sure. Like for D3 brains, it's for sure compact, but for uh, right. For example, like F theory on, on the P1, you might think it's compact because it's just a position of the seven brains on a P1. But that's not true. It's just the elliptic uh, degeneration of SO18, comma two. That's a complex structure. That's a modulus. So what, what is the runaway direction in terms well, of the, the points coming right? together or something? It's just the same as the moduli of SO18, comma two. It's a usual heterotic string moduli. So, so you might think it's compact, but you have to put the correct metric and all that. No, but the, the full full moduli space is non-compact. But what kind? What is the runaway behavior in terms of the D7 brain? SO18. Oh. The, the, the simplest example is P1 with with the 24 D7 brains. And the moduli space is given by SO18, comma 2 over SO18 times SO2. And the degenerations are the usual degenerations of the Narayan moduli, <clears throat> which you can okay. translate them. Yeah. And yeah, we shouldn't, we should probably discuss it. It's not directly related to what he's saying. Okay. Um, can, can I ask um, something? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Originally, when you want to stabilize complex structure and uh, you write down this equation, whatever, d omega equals zero. In principle, if I have a generic Calabiao, I would have expected there is a generic function omega that could be including whatever large volume contribution, or large complex structure contributions, but non-perturbative corrections or who knows what. It's a very complicated function for a generic Calabiao. And I would have thought if I turn on a single unit of flux, it should in principle stabilize all complex structure on a sufficiently generic Calabiao. Now you're giving counter examples where this doesn't work, but CP3 and the sextic and K3 times K3 are of course highly symmetric, right? They are very special among all Calabiaos. That's why we can study them. Do you have any intuition on this kind of genericity expectation that one unit of flux should stabilize all complex structure if omega is sufficiently complicated or no? Um. Obviously, I, I don't have a, have a very good argument there because I mean this is uh, this is very difficult to study. I mean I, I would need to to know the, the period maps and a very non non symmetric case and um, I don't really know what to do with that. Um, and but I mean I think it is indicated by these examples that even though I agree that if I just count equations and a number of variables. In principle, one flux is, is generating, um, is generating the, the right number of equations for the right number of, of variables. But um, it seems to be the case, case that this one, one flux um, probably does not give a, uh, does not necessarily give a consistent vacuum. Um, uh, I mean, could I ask you a follow-up question on that? Sorry. 
So uh, uh, in, in our paper, what we did is to uh, choose some fluxes such that some of the moduli are still massless, even with the inclusion of the fluxes at the productive level in, in the language of type 2A. And then <clears throat> uh, those like massless fields will be stabilized by higher type 2A instant and corrections. And for example, I, I think that kind of thing should also happen for like general clavier because of the fact that if you go to higher degree uh, type 2A instant terms, those instant terms will depend on most of the Keller moduli. So I, I think that's kind of what Tim is saying. And, and the examples that you have studied, like K3 and K3, have no genus zero Gopakuma Vapa invariance, right? So that you cannot expect such a uh, instant and correction stabilizing some of the massless fields. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's going to be really interesting to actually study some real, more complicated generic Calabio in, in that like a higher order instant corrections could possibly stabilize some of the massless fields, but, but the MS will be quite small though. It, um, yeah, no, I mean, this is certainly, I mean, kind of what, what I'm trying to hint at that one somehow needs to, to study more more complicated examples to, to see if something like this can possibly be, be true or not. I mean, if I remember correctly in, in your paper, I mean, you're, you're trying to, I mean, you're, you're working at the large complex structure point and then you're stabilizing um, all but one modulus at fluxes. And I think uh, you, you explicitly see that um, you're, one has to choose fluxes in a certain way that a certain like mass matrix is, is non-degenerate. Yes, um, uh, that, that was start a... with all these moduli except for one, and I think this is then showing that you cannot choose these these fluxes arbitrarily small. Uh, that was a particular example, but what you can also do is to choose some flux, uh, fluxes such that like many many complex structure moduli are massless at the perturbative level. Although in, in that case, you've got to compute lots of Gupta Vapa invariants to ensure that the uh, rest of the massless fields are stabilized. But often cases, it is possible. I see. Okay. 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 Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Let me maybe um, go on with um, the K3 times K3 example. Um, so modular stabilization on K3 times K3 actually has already been considered a long time ago. And for example, in this paper here by Asperman and Kalos, um, they easily managed to stabilize all complex structure moduli within the type bound. Um, which in this for case, um, the Euler number of K3 times K3, K3 divided by 24 is exactly 24. So this is actually not too large a number, but uh, it is actually possible to, to find fluxes which stabilize all complex structure moduli at all. Um, but we want to, to look at this from a slightly different um, perspective. So there was a paper by Andreas Braun and collaborators um, where they show that you can actually stabilize all moduli um, the Keller and complex structure moduli um, by fluxes. And um, this example is, uh, is particularly interesting because I, I don't need to have the knowledge of, of any period maps or, or um, other complicated expressions. So here we would like to explicitly stabilize all moduli, so Keller and complex structure moduli of K3 times K3 by fluxes. So we want to stabilize all moduli which we possibly can stabilize by fluxes. And uh, it turns out that we want to do that at a generic point, a moduli space. So uh, neither of the two K3 develops a singularity. And we want to find uh, the optimal flux configuration such that um, the flux charge, the G4, which G4 um, becomes as small as possible. And we will uh, try to, uh, we will use some computer search to, to find such optimal flux configurations. Um, so let me review a, a few, few details about K3. So um, here we, we almost exclusively focus on the middle cohomology of K3, um, the H2, the integer H2 um, corresponds to the following lattice, um, which is E8 times E8 and then uh, three times this U lattice. So it gives um, even self dual lattice, uh, the unique even self dual lattice of uh, signature three comma 19, which I try to denote by, by this um, lattice with the black dots here. And a point of moduli space is given by, by specifying uh, 
a choice of three self dual three forms like omega one, two, three, which corresponds to specifying a, a hyperkähler, um, hyperkähler structure on, on that manifold. And um, these three, th three, three forms um, span a certain three plane in, in this lattice, which I, I denote here um, by, by this red plane. And in, um, in, um, in Calabria languages, two of them will, will give the holomorphic two form and one the Kähler form. So specifying these three guys will specify uniquely a point in a modular space of K3. And um, at a generic point in, in modular space, the three planes is oriented generically and will, will not align with any of the, um, these uh, lattice sites. But however, if I, if I rotate it um, such that um, one of the, the lattice sites, a root of the lattice, so a, a point with, with norm two is exactly orthogonal um, to the three plane, then um, the K3 develops an orbifold singularity. So, and um, it um, was then shown in, in this paper how to use um, this knowledge to, to stabilize um, flux compactifications on K3 times K3. So we want to, to study four form fluxes which have um, two legs on, on each of the uh, K3s. Um, so if I, if I choose a, a basis, the integer basis of the middle cohomology, I can expand the four form flux in this, in this form. So, um, oops, sorry. So I can, so all fluxes are uh, described in terms of a 22 by 22 dimension integer matrix. And we can use this matrix to, to define a map which maps from um, the middle cohomology of K3 to onto itself um, by, by combining this matrix with the intersection form on, on, on H2 in the following form. And one easy thing which one can do from this map is to observe that um, the flux carried by, um, the, the charge carried by the fluxes is just the trace of, of this matrix or so one half the, the trace of this matrix. Um, but um, it was worked out that this matrix is actually um, even more helpful to, to describe flux compactification because um, if this matrix N, um, this, this guy here, if it is diagonalizable and has uh, non-negative eigenvalues, then um, we found a Minkowski vacuum um, this again is actually showing us that not every generic um, flux configuration um, gives rise um, to actually a good consistent vacuum. So flux configurations have to satisfy certain conditions. Maybe this also goes back to, um, to Tim's question that um, even though maybe a generic simple flux configuration naively gives the right number of uh, equations, not every flux configuration actually gives rise to a good vacuum. Um, so if I found, but on the other hand, if I found such an end, such that it is diag diagonalizable and has non-negative eigenvalues, um, I will find I have 22 eigenvectors and 19 of them will have negative norm. Three on the other hand will have, oops, sorry, will have positive norm. And I can identify the three eigenvectors as positive norm with the three positive norm uh, two forms with the Kähler and holomorphic two form. Therefore, this uniquely or this uniquely um, specifies a, a point in moduli space. So this shows me how I relate really um, this the the spectrum the eigenvectors of, of this matrix n with the point of moduli space of, of my K three. And um, this point in moduli space is only uniquely, there are no flat directions left if degenerate eigenspaces um, have definite signatures. So I, I could have a degenerate eigenvalue and a corresponding degenerate eigen, uh, eigenspace. And I want all of these eigenvectors to be either all of positive norm or either all of negative norm. Otherwise, um, it is not uniquely uh, determined what are the positive norm eigenvectors here. So, um, this condition uh, corresponds to, to the stabilization of all moduli. And moreover, um, I want that there's no root um, of the K3 lattice orthogonal to um, um, these three positive norm eigenvectors. And in this case, I find that the K3 is smooth. Um, 
so I, I can, one can describe the, the whole um, flux compactification game just in properties of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, et cetera, of um, this integer matrix. So the goal would be to find an integer matrix, a flux matrix, with, which satisfies all these three conditions and has a minimal trace because the trace corresponds to the charge uh, covered by fluxes. And to do that, we, we use an evolutionary algorithm. So um, that's a, a very clever computer algorithm. Maybe uh, let me be a very brief here because I feel I'm running a bit out of time. So this is a um, computer algorithm which kind of mimics biological evolution. I start with a population of, in this case, matrices. And I, I aim at uh, optimizing a certain fitness function by doing um, operations which one borrows from biological evolution, like I mutate a certain matrix, then I, I cross it over with another matrix in my population and eventually I will select these matrices um, which have uh, the minimal fitness function, which are the fittest, so to say, and I repeat this process over and over again to find an, an optimal matrix in the end. So, um, and we implemented or we, this approach for, for our problem um, using the, the Julia programming language. And here our population are these 22 by 22 um, flux matrices. And we designed a, a fitness function um, which tries to, to give penalties whenever we violate um, one of these three conditions, one, two, three. So um, we give a penalty if there's a non-diagonalizable matrix, if there's negative or complex eigenvalues, if there's degenerate eigenspaces of split signature, or if there's roots orthogonal to the three positive norm eigenvectors. And we also give a penalty to uh, a large trace of that matrix. And then we, we let the algorithm do its thing and try to find um, matrices which satisfy all these three conditions and with a minimal um, trace n. And even though this algorithm is, uh, is doing its job very well, um, it turned out that this is actually still a pretty, uh, pretty difficult problem. I mean, A, because our search space is actually huge. For example, if I only focus on matrices which have entries zero and plus minus one, I get 10 to the 231 um, different matrices. So, I mean, no way to explore the whole search space. And moreover, um, implementing this goal, which we have to like solve at each step is, uh, is a very difficult problem on its own. Um, finding or determine, determ finding if there are roots which are orthogonal um, to, to our positive norm eigenvectors is actually an NP hard problem on its own. So at every step in this evolutionary search, we have to solve a difficult NP hard problem. So therefore the whole thing converges uh, very slow. So um, we kind of used a two-fold strategy. We, we tried runs with a very large population. In this case, this means uh, larger than a thousand uh, and let it run for, for a long time, order of weeks, or also with a small population, smaller than 1000 in this case, and let it run for a short time, like order of days. And whenever um, we have the feeling that these searches uh, converged, we also used a, a local brute force search which just randomly switched on and off um, entries of this matrix to, to explore around that local minima. And here's what we found. So we managed to generate order of 10 to the five different matrices with a flux um, by, uh, with a charge by fluxes of 25. But uh, we did not find a, a single matrix with a um, fluxes of uh, charge 24 or lower, which I think is very interesting given that here actually um, the the Euler number by 24 is actually 24. So we, we did not find a single matrix which uh, actually satisfies tadpole cancellation, but a lot which uh, do not satisfy tadpole um, cancellation by, um, by just one. And I should mention that if we, um, if we neglect this condition of having uh, a smooth K3, then it's actually kind of easy to find uh, configurations with 24 or lower. So it does not seem to be able to possible to 
moduli uh, to stabilize moduli at a, at a smooth point in a moduli space. And we can also try to uh, find this uh, tuple constant, which I mentioned earlier in the conjecture by dividing the minimal Q by the number of moduli. And this is roughly 0 0.44. So again, it's roughly one half again. Um, so, I mean, one, one should probably also be a bit skeptical about this result. I mean, one could ask, um, maybe we, we just did not explore enough matrices to find something with a flux equal or smaller than 24. Maybe we should have just generated more matrices um, to find something like that. So um, we also looked at a, at a slightly um, different problem. Um, so instead of uh, studying the, the 22 by 22 um, dimension, the 22 dimension K3 lattice, we could impose the same problem on, on smaller, smaller later, uh, lattices, lattices, for example, some AN lattice times U times U times U. And then we can impose the same conditions as before, or analogous conditions as before, and try to do the same computer search. And in this case, we always found um, now much easier because the search space is much smaller that this converges to some Q which is of um, the order of the dimension of the lattice. And um, we, we can let it go on for as long as we want that we never found anything smaller. Um, so here's for example, the development of Q over time. And we see this converges very small to a, to a minimal Q but um, then it uh, never finds anything. Um, smaller. So we conclude that um, for, for all these lattices, we always find a minimal Q, which is of order of the dimension of the lattice, which is actually consistent with our result above. But of course, it's, uh, it's not a proof, but uh, I think it's very strong, strong evidence. Um, okay, let me, let me skip over this um, for the sake of time. So, um, so to, to summarize these results here, um, so if we consider M theory, F theory on K3 times K3, if we want to stabilize all moduli at a generic point in moduli space, and um, we want to have fluxes with arbitrary small and two charge um, Q less or equal than, than 24, turns out we, we cannot have all three of them. So if we want um, to have fluxes with an with a small charge, with an arbitrary small charge, we always have additional light degree of freedoms, either by non-stabilized moduli or by baggage groups arising from, from singularities. Okay, so let me finally talk briefly about the Zeta vacuum. Um, let me be quick with that because I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time. So, um, as we discussed in an earlier paper, so um, I want to, to discuss anti-brain uplift on a warp deformed conifold, the kleber nosch kassler throat, um, which is described by one complex structure modulus, the deformation parameter of the conifold, and this deformation parameter also goes into, uh, into the warp factor on, on the kleber nosch kassler solution. And um, the whole solution is, is stabilized by fluxes on the, on the A and the B cycle of the conifold. And in, in these papers here, um, they, they computed the potential, the blue line um, for, for this modulus, um, the deformation parameter of the Kleber of Kassler throat, which in the end is, is parameterizing the, the length of the throat and therefore the amount of hierarchy I have between the IR and the UV of the throat. And so if I add an anti-brain to this uh, configuration, this anti-brain is also giving, a, con is giving a, a contribution to the potential for this modulus S um, because um, its energy is just the, the warp down uh, energy density of the anti-brain. And since the warp factor depends on S, therefore also the energy density of the brain depends on S. So if I now add the potentials, the potential I showed you on the previous slide and the anti-brain potential, I get a situation like this. Depending on how much flux I have in the Kleber of Kassler throat, I either obtain a stable desita minimum, or if they have um, not enough flux, I actually obtain a runaway behavior. And uh, we, we tried to evaluate this bound, and we found that uh, square root g string times s uh, times um, m, where m is the number of fluxes, has to be small, uh, larger than a certain number. In this case, we determined it for one antibrain to be 6.8. So let's put this together with our previous considerations on, 
on top flow cancellation and, uh, and the charge carried um, by fluxes. So the hierarchy um, in the Kleber of Strassner throat, the hierarchy between the IR and the UV scale um, is, is parameterized by the absolute value of uh, this deformation parameter S and which is stabilized at e to the minus, essentially the ratio of the fluxes on the B cycle and the A cycle. And we found that G string times M squared um, has, to be, has to be larger than a certain value. And on the other hand, uh, K times M is exactly the, the D3 charge, um, which is carried by the fluxes in the throat. So um, the K times M, this Q throat, should be given by the uh, charge covered by the localized fluxes minus uh, the charge of, of all the fluxes in the bike of the Calabiao. Um, so I can, I can try to, to bound this hierarchy using, um, using these two equations. So the logarithm of, logarithm of the UV um, divided by the IR scale um, scales like m times k divided by g string m squared by, by just taking this, this guy from up here. Um, um, so and m times k is the, the amount of charge in the throat and g as m squared is, is bounded by this expression. So I find that um, the hierarchy between the UV and the IR scales roughly like um, this, like 5% of um, the number of, uh, of the charge in the throat. So for example, if I, if I take KKT example and I want a hierarchy of say 10 to the minus 10, this translates to having a, a charge of roughly 500 in the throat. So I need at least uh, 500 um, localized D3 charges to accommodate for that many fluxes. So I generically need a, a large number of moduli. So if I apply our tadpole consolation condition, uh, our tadpole conjecture to, um, to this situation, um, now in the language of F theory, this Q throat is then um, the, the localized charges given by the Euler number of the fourfold minus all um, the um, fluxes I have in the bike to stabilize bike moduli. And using our conjecture, we find that this is one quarter minus alpha times the number of, of bike moduli. And again, if this alpha is smaller than one quarter, I would not expect to find a, a large Q, Q throw to, to accommodate for, for large hierarchy. So if this conjecture is true and this alpha is smaller, uh, so this should be, if alpha is larger than, than one over four, which is consistent with all our examples, um, I, I would not find enough fluxes to accommodate a, a, a large uh, hierarchy in the Kilanov Strassler throat um, as I needed for, for KKLT anti brain uplift. Um, so let me maybe quickly summarize. So we, we formulated this type of conjecture, which um, roughly states that the flux um, needed to stabilize a certain number of n moduli scales linearly with the number of moduli. And if true, this provides a serious challenge for, for F-theory vacuum with many moduli and also for anti-brain uplift in, in long warp throats. Um, obviously, um, as, as we already briefly discussed, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of open questions. I mean, there's a question um, what happens if I, if I allow for a certain number of singularities and in realistic models, I, I, I definitely would allow for a certain number of singularities. Can I, can I um, milden the bound by that conjecture? Um, can I generate more generic examples um, for, for less symmetric, less specific calabiaos? And maybe even is it possible to formulate certain, certain analytic arguments? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, 